All right, and welcome to yet another episode of Uncovering Unexplained Mysteries for Wednesday, November 30th, 2016. I am here, as always, with Michel from France as my co-host. How, how are you doing, Le Michel? Uh, I don't know if I... I like that name but okay all right well we're trying to class it up we're trying to class up class the podcast up. We're trying to be classy all yeah, right yeah okay. so you're Le not, Michel. We're, not, we're not we're trying to not be so trashy over here that's right so trashy mouths um i'm doing fine uh just took my second to last test the last test before the final for my math class i think i passed it like the only thing i messed up on i believe is the teacher asked for a histogram and I forgot what that was, so I just went in and just did a normal bar graph instead of a histogram. So I'm hoping at least you won't knock off that many points. I hope it's not one of those, like, you didn't write do a histogram. No points. Or, like, you get, like, two points for the doing all the other stuff right. You don't need math. You need a, you need a good gumshoe. A gumshoe on the <laughs> scene. I don't know where that term came from. Some kind of detective crap, for all I know. Um, I am doing... Uh, not so great. Um, well, okay, I guess. I don't know. I'm recovering. Um, I've been kind of going through a personal shit with my, uh, now ex-girlfriend, and, um, yeah, breakups are a lot crappier than I last remembered, because I hadn't been in, like, a long-term relationship for a long time, and, uh, this l most recent one I was in was, um, you know, the first one I had been in, and, and probably two or three years and uh we dated for almost a year and um yeah at first i thought i was like all oh, okay with you know the breakup and then i guess when reality kind of set in around thanksgiving it was like oh this actually oh heartache oh yeah that's what this feels like man this is a god awful feeling and as somebody who already suffers from like ocd and anxiety and stuff like it really only makes all that stuff worse too like on top of all that so I'm trying to stay positive. I'm a very, I'm a very strong person mentally, so I'm trying to stay occupied. I have a great network of friends around me that to kind of support me. But sometimes you just still have that raw shit emotion inside that you just can't get rid of, and you just have to literally deal with it. Um, so it's kind of held me back from doing a lot of the stuff I would normally be doing, like working on videos and stuff like that. But as I am getting better, I do hope to. Uh, I, taste test some German food um, and then another thing with that is I was gonna do that video a long time ago but the candy I ordered from Germany is gonna take uh, it's not gonna be here till like late December which sucks <laughs> so now I'm having to like reschedule my whole shooting for like my videos and stuff because like that was meant yeah to, that was meant to be the next video maybe you should have gotten one of those like just random you know it's not gonna necessarily be German but there's a bunch of these like meal boxes like snack yeah boxes I, you can get i saw that but i i, I did kind of want this to specifically be german because like mm. the only other country i really have a fascination with besides like england is germany um mm. i'm kind of fascinated by canada just because i'm like I'm, I'm wondering how are they even different than us in any way i mean i know their healthcare system is different but they just seem like the way they speak in some you know ways as well it just definitely. they just seem like a like a like a more upper United States to me. Like we don't really even seem like the, that different of. I mean, I know of course like the Canadian listeners are rolling their eyes right now because uh, politically we couldn't be any more different than uh -huh. especially than what we are now with uh, Donald Trump as our president. Um, so yeah, I know politically we're very different, but I think as far as everything else, so that I'm kind of fascinated by Canada. But yeah, Germany, <laughs> I, it was just always a country I've been fascinated by, and not because of Nazi shit at all. It's just <laughs> the language and the music, uh, as far yeah. as like you know some of the rock music and stuff like that. I, I really like. Well, so. my favorite, my favorite, probably my favorite band ever is Scorpions, and they're they're a German band. Yeah, and who so. who chose to to speak in English for their songs and that's why they got as big as they got. Uh my my favorite German band, well my two favorite German bands is Kraftwerk and uh Rammstein. Rammstein, Rammstein is good too, but Yeah, Rammstein I, it's just, the vocals to me are just I don't know, I don't get into I can hear I, I can I'm okay with a few of their songs, it's just I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, it's not run together. It's not for everybody. <laughs> um, I I, th I think uh, you know, and again, you know, German people are like, oh, there's so many better bands than Rammstein in our country. Yeah, well, they never got big enough to where I found out about them. So they might be great, but. But the, the Scorpions did. Uh, yeah. Well, but well, uh, German band that continue to speak to do their music in German. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. I I once heard somewhere, and I don't know how credible this is. If Rammstein actually did their lyrics in English, they'd be one of the biggest hard rock bands out right now. But because they chose to stick with German, they're huh. they're not nearly. But but I mean, they're they're still huge. But they could be even bigger. But I'm glad they they stick to German. Anyway, getting into our. Um, fan request month uh over the over the you know last year i guess even though it hasn't even been a year yet it's been like six or seven months since we've yeah. been doing this podcast uh i've just like racked up a laundry list of requests from various people and i just thought it would be a good idea to kind of i guess december the season of giving or whatever is to yeah. just give back it, and just do a whole month of it's um, our gift to you guys yeah so for for your support now, and for listening. Now, if you want to ask me where every single one of these requests came from, I can't tell you. Um, I know where some of them came from because they're more recent, but some I've had on here since the early days of our podcast back when it was still on the YouTube uh, channel or whatever. So I, I can't tell you who requested what on some of these things, but um, I think all the ones this time around are pretty recent requests, although there is an older one thrown in there that someone wanted. Um, the first one we're going to start on is the uh, I-70 killer. Uh, I-70 would be an interstate in the United States. Um, believe the evenly numbered interstates go um, east to west, and the odd ones go north to south. Just a fun little fact. Anyway, um, so 26-year-old Robin Fold Foldow is what this looks like, uh, or Fold Fold. Full Dower? Full Dower. They always say the, like, how, I don't know if it's the audio of Unsolved Mysteries or how Robert Stack says it, but I, I never get the names clear when he just says it. Like, I have to see it printed later on somewhere in the... Yeah, I don't know what it is either, but, you know, it's, to me, it sound it, it reads like a Full Dower. Okay, but so, Robin Full, full Dower, uh, in, in the, Indianapolis, Indiana, she wanted nothing more than to start a family and to find a husband. On April 8, 1992, Robin was found shot to death at a shoe store that she worked at. Then, flash forward, 23-year-old Patricia Smith and 32-year-old Patricia Majors were both happily married. They worked side-by-side -side at a bridal shop in Wichita, Kansas. Just three days after Robin Fuldauer was murdered, both Patricias were found shot dead in the back storage room of the bridal shop. Then, 24-year-old Nancy Kitzmiller had just recently qualified to join a government map-making team. That sounds exciting. Three weeks after the Patricia murders, Nancy was shot to death in the boot store where she worked as a manager. Four murders in three different states. They seemed to be random killings that had no connection, yet each took place at a shopping mall off Interstate 70 on a road that either connected to Interstate 70 or was off Interstate 70 directly. So there was a connection after all. Raytown, Missouri, another link in this deadly chain. A Woodsville shopping mall off a, uh, off a connecting road. 37-year-old Sarah Blessing was working alone at a gift shop at a mall. At 6.30 p.m. that day, an auctioneer noticed a stranger walking into his auction house. He walked in and walked back out. Also at that time, Tim Hickman, who owned a video store. What's a video store? Mike? Oh, a video store. Okay, all right. <laughs> Mike, what's a video store? A video store is uh, a store back in the day that actually uh, rented and sold videotapes. Because uh, before DVD and Blu-ray and Netflix and Amazon Prime and all of that, and torrents and the internet, there was a video store. Ooh. Ah. So anyway, Tim Hickman... I like seeing that. I, I, I like too. seeing that in the reenactment because that was a nice blast from the past. Yeah. It, it really it really sets the scene that, hey, motherfucker, you're watching a 90s-ass TV show and you better like it. That's what... <laughs> so this guy who owned a video store next to the gift shop where Sarah Blessing worked, he took notice of this man as he walked past his store. Minutes Tim later... Tim Hickman. Yeah, Tim Hickman. Minutes later, Tim heard a loud pop that sounded like a gun. Tim looked outside and noticed the stranger. 
At the same time, a worker from a grocery store near the mall noticed a man climbing up an embankment to Interstate 70. Meanwhile, while Tim walked over to the gift shop, he looked in through the door. He didn't see anything, so he opened the door, calling out, Ma'am? Ma'am? I don't know why I gave him a slight southern accent just then. <laughs> he walked into the store, uh, and he didn't get far until he saw Sarah's leg sticking out from a storage room. Um, Tim immediately called the police. A multi-state task force was formed. All five women killed with the same gun, semi-automatic pistol with a 22 caliber ammunition. That gun was also linked to another victim, Michael McCown, McCrown? McCown? Who, was killed McCown. In, who was killed in a shopping mall ceramic store near Interstate 70. There was now six victims. So, I don't know, man. That's weird, you know? Like, yeah. You know, like, when you're on a road trip or you go on a road trip and, like, you just, like... And, and like, they, even though in the, the segment they say shopping mall, they're not shopping malls in the sense that, like... No, they're they're not, they're not like... They're uh, strip malls. They're, like, strip, yeah, strip malls, malls that sell, yeah. like, to me, that sell, like, tchotchkes and knickknacks and crap, like... Just crap for tourists. Yeah. I think a it's, lot of It's this... not the Mall of America. It's not like that or, or Washington Square or... Or the recent mall during Black Friday that actually, I think, I think there was like somebody got killed or something Good during Lord. the Black Friday sale or something or injured. Very Police good. had to be called in or something. Yeah. Oh, I wonder what I wonder what they were uh, fighting over. Well, I saw this video on Facebook that just showed a wide shot of people trying to get TVs at like a Walmart or something. Uh, and it was just it was crazy <laughs> it was like watching sharks try to you know a bunch of great white sharks trying to fight over a bunch of chum it was just like <laughs> it's it was so just ridiculous nuts. I, I like this is my thing about like Black Friday and all the other kind of stuff I would rather and I know this isn't everybody but this is just this is just me how I feel I would rather pay more and, yeah. and have the convenience to go down there whenever I freaking want, not deal with any crowds, not have to wake mm -hmm. up at the ass crack of dawn. I would rather pay more money to do that than to go through all that crap that people go through on yeah. Black Friday. Exactly. I would too. I, I, I am not so impatient that, oh man, like I can't, I can't wait to get that TV. Like if you just wait another month, you could probably save another hundred bucks and then, or depending on how much money you make. Or a couple months, and you can go get that TV with no lines, no craziness. Well, you know, you don't for have a fact, to fighting off other people. You know for a fact too that that uh, there's a lot of shit that's bought on Black Friday that's not even needed in that person's life. Oh, exactly. And then there's also the stuff on Black Friday that it the deals aren't really that great. I mean, uh, oh, like this DVD or Blu-ray, like oh, I I pay like a little bit more to get it without this hassle. Like, they buy it online. I mean, so I, I, I do stuff online. You know, I'll buy some movies and stuff. Uh, I bought some movies on a Black Friday sale on a different site. You know, I like uncovering unexplained mysteries, but they just go off on these wild tangents, like, right in the middle of the segment, and it, I had to turn it off. I just couldn't... Sorry, lady. Fine, we'll go back to the story, okay? So... <laughs> Uh, the, uh. the most promising lead from this story came from the first case that we talked about in Wichita. Police believe the, sus the well, actually it wasn't the first case, it was the second case. Um, police believe the suspect chose a bridal store because he believed there'd be a single female employee there. He was probably surprised to find two women on duty. Moments later, a customer arrived to pick up a cummerbund for his tuxedo. He had no idea that the two Patricias had already been shot. And I thought this was a really good reenactment, like this part yeah. here. Um, the actor well, previously, I mean, the whole thing is great. I mean, the actor they have to play the mysterious uh, serial killer, he looks mysterious. He is he's creepy. Um, Thank Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. Yeah, yeah, but if he was like a serial killer. Uh, yeah, definitely uh, need to shoot you in the head. Definitely need to shoot you in the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're gonna make me miss Wapner, uh, uh, but uh, that one I got. Hey, I got a movie reference. Hey, <laughs> you got one. Yay! Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I rarely but, uh, ever use. I, I rarely yeah. ever abuse a kazoo, but in that moment, I felt that's not even there, a kazoo. I don't know what it yeah. is. Yeah, 
there's other uh, uh, stuff with reenactment that got me to like just the whole sh- image of the woman just shot in the head, laying there on the floor. I mean, just think about that. Think about if you're the, if you're the employee at the rental place, and you just walk across the street, and then you just see the just seeing the feet. Yeah, it'd be surreal. That, it'd be like I'm not yeah. I'm not actually seeing what I'm seeing right now. Like this isn't actually like real. Exactly. You'd be thinking, well, I've, I this, I, I have to be dreaming, or you know, it's a nightmare, or I've seen too many episodes of this certain show that I like. <laughs> yeah, I liked this particular sequence in the reenactment though, because like they they rarely oh, the, they rarely the tension was really really. But it was, it was. You really could feel it. I I also like too, like because unsolved mysteries for the most part, for the most part, it is a very like white person show. Like all <laughs> like all the segments and cases are very kind of white, and like you know Robert Stack is very proper in how he speaks. But the actor that they got that walks in the store to get the cummerbund or whatever. He's like this, you know, good young looking black guy and like you rarely see this kind of interaction in unsolved mysteries. Like he it's it's not it's such a nice contrast cuz he comes in and the killer, a pasty white guy, is like getting the back. And then the customer was like, "Hey man, <laughs> I can't do that, man. Like I I, I got to get out of here, man. I didn't I didn't see nothing, man." Yeah. And just kind of how he delivered that line, you know, it's like, "Yeah, you know, it's like cool it's because you usually don't see that in the reenactments you usually see the person like okay i'll get in the back and the killer you know is just like well uh get the hell out of here then and don't call the cops i mean i might try bolting for the door and just run as fast as i freaking can out of that out of the shop like that's the thing i might think about doing but then might shoot me in the back so yeah well that (laughs) yeah that would be my fear too you know i mean that that gun man but then like the guy's got a gun on me he's probably gonna if he wants me to go in the back that means he probably wants to shoot me in the head so i don't know i mean i i I, maybe i take my chance of just fucking running like hell it's a gamble because because you know i've seen many uh, segments on this show where they you know in bank robberies for instance they take them in the vault and they tie them up and they they you know just leave them there because they just want to get the money and run uh, it, but in this, this case, clearly wasn't a bank robbery, though. It didn't right. look like a bank robbery. You go in, you you see that there's that there's no there's nothing out of the register. Um, it's not really gonna. There's not gonna be that much money in the register to begin with. And then there's this clean cut guy in a trench coat with glasses, or I don't know if he had glasses or not. He didn't have glasses. Because he's pointing. He I don't know. He's a uh, you know pointing a gun at you it's just like go on the back <laughs> you know it's like i don't want to <laughs> it's like look man i don't know anything i don't know what you want i didn't see nothing i i i, I need to get out of here Which, I, I do like that where the guy's like okay all right go <laughs> yeah and he tells him not to call cops which to me is like LOL, WTF, that's the first thing I'm going to do, you know what I mean? Like, that is the first thing I'm doing. It is surprising, that's one of the things that stood out to me, too, is that the killer actually let him go. Yeah, which they said in the show, they said, surprisingly, the killer let that that witness survive, which is what he was, he was a witness, he saw the dude's face and everything... And uh, again, may, I don't know. Maybe he thought that you know he the the guy really wasn't gonna. I don't who the fuck knows, you know. So a short time later, the guy, the witness, actually did call the police, um, giving the, his description and other people corroborating the description. The police came up with a composite sketch of the killer: thirty-five to forty years old, one hundred seventy pounds, reddish hair, high forehead. And kind of a funny detail here. What witnesses describe as lazy eyelids, <laughs> I, which totally makes sense, but it's just kind of yeah. a funny term, lazy eyelids. When I think of the term lazy eyelids, I think of uh, Jonathan Banks from Breaking Bad, um, uh-huh. his character. Uh, I forget his character's name exactly, but uh, Jonathan Banks is a badass. He always has been a badass actor. I think of my dad because my dad has such a lazy. His his eyes are so lazy that it looks like he's asleep. Yeah. You know, right. so it's hard to tell sometimes if he's awake. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. Uh, but the guy was also clean cut and neatly dressed. Um, again, and I don't know if it's just the reenactment that did this, but it reminded me very much of uh, Dustin Hoffman from uh, yeah, he, Rain Man. The, 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 the sketch to the first one they showed that was like more of a charcoal sketch. 
that does that's a little bit of it. I see a little bit of Dustin Hoffman there as well. Yeah. So um, he seemed like he was almost in like a trance like state too when he'd walk. Like he would walk like he was like walking and like with a purpose, you know. But in like this trance, like kind of, you know. Well, yeah, because like, he's just thinking about what he's gonna do. Yeah. So unfortunately, All that's on his head. <clears throat> unfortunately, after the segment was filmed, uh, another murder struck, uh, killing a woman in Arlington, Texas. Um, the woman that was killed was killed with a different gun, but the M.O. was so similar that police are almost certain it's the same guy. So, that is, that is pretty much the case. Um, there was also, uh, three additional murders in Texas in 1993, 1994, probably including the one that happened after the, uh, segment aired, that the police also believe were the work of the same killer bringing the number of victims to nine. Now, one of the, some of the other later victims, they weren't shot with the same gun. They were apparently shot with a different gun, um, which is interesting. Well, maybe he was just changed his MO or he, or he changed his weapon because people were on to him or something. Um, so no new... What I find no kind new. of... No, nothing new, really. I guess apparently her bomb master uh, from... Ba uh, Baumeister, her Baumeister from Westfield, Indiana, was suspected of being the killer, but he committed suicide after numerous human bones were discovered on his estate. The bones turned out to be male, and Baumeister was alleged to have killed male homosexuals and could not be linked to the murders of the women. Uh, but he also killed a guy. So, uh, Also, Donald Michael Prince, later Donald Alvin Blom, Convicted in the murder of Kathleen Katie Elizabeth Poirier, and a second victim since, has also been named as a suspect in the I-70 killings. He was known to be suffering from throat cancer, which is now in remission, and to have owned a 22 semi-automatic similar to what was used to kill Patricia Magers and Patricia Smith. Man, you know what's disturbing on this Unsolved Wikia website is... You can actually, they have a link at the bottom of all these page for all these cases where you can actually like find their grave. Like it, it yeah. There's a website and it's called findagrave.com and it'll actually like take it'll it'll tell you where their grave is and you can go and. I mean, I don't I don't know if that's like sick or if that's like decent of them where maybe you could go and lay flowers if you wanted to or. Something like that. I don't know. I just that's kind of that's kind of bizarre to me. Yeah, it it is strange that they have the that. case was also featured on America's Most Wanted, and apparently was covered in much more detail on something called Dark Minds, which I guess was another unsolved mysteries kind of thing spinoff. Never heard of it. So yeah, I mean, you know, why did he choose Interstate seventy? You know, why why did he just go and 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 shoot these women? randomly there was no there was no even sexual assault i mean it, the show doesn't say anything yeah. about him taking any money um it's it, you know he's one of these these uh fringe members of society that's just a loose cannon you know like he get he gets his rocks off from killing i guess women and you said we're saying something about homosexual men well it could be that i mean they said that's a rumor that it that one of the guys that they think could be the killer uh, was was known for killing male homosexuals, huh. um, but this guy, yeah, I don't know. I had part. It probably goes back to his childhood. He had a really rough childhood. His mother was abusive to him, or something. So he hates women because of that. Or he had a really, 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 really bad breakup, and he was really didn't let it go. Um, the I seventy thing is very curious to me. I just I don't. It's hard to really pinpoint why his motive is like, oh, I'm going to go in and I'm going to, his MO is I'm going to go in and I'm going to just kill a bunch of people at I-70 strip malls. Uh, it, it, but it does seem to be a lot of just these kind of just small businesses, little tiny shops with female clerks. But he did kill one guy. So it seems like it's the killing it, it, it's not, I don't I don't think it necessarily has to be a woman. I think it's just it's just got to keep killing. I guess he, he said uh, he probably prefers women, but I think at one instance where he killed that guy, it, it, it was one of those instances where he 
you know, he settled for him. Well, Which maybe maybe up. the guy remind, but, maybe the guy reminded him of somebody from his past that he didn't like that was male. Maybe he looked like his dad, or maybe he looked yeah. like you know, or, or 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 it's just he just it's just the kill. It's just the thrill of the kill. <laughs> that was very um, poignant, Mike. How you worded that? Almost. Well, there's a, almost. There's too a lot poignant. of guys called thrill killers, <laughs> so. Yeah, but but it's just so some something about the way you said that it just. Makes it kind of curious, is all I'm saying. How you said thrill of the kill. All right. Oh, come on. That's fine. Okay, Mike. All right, that's fine. You can you can move on to the next topic, but um, I'm watching you. There's nothing to watch. <laughs> oh, oh, now there's something to watch. You're trying to divert the attention. Now I'm watching even harder. <laughs> and I still think you know about Bigfoot more than what you're telling me. You live at Bigfoot's backyard. Any hoozles, uh, that was the I-70 killer. I mean, really, there's nothing else really to say about the case. Uh, I, I did think it was a great segment. It was one of those short and sweet um, segments. Uh, I think what made it more interesting was the Interstate 70 connection. Um, yeah. The shitty strip malls that he chose to kill at. That was also interesting. The more random, like, out in left field details about a murder case, the more fascinated I am by it. Um, killers. it doesn't seem like he drove around in a car either. It seems like he did all this on foot, because it's that's what it seems like. Because they saw him walking around, and then there's other witnesses that saw him walk up the embankment and just. Which was spear. one of which was one of the um, one of the ways why, why I got away with it. Because if this guy was hitching rides, which he would have had to have to cover so much, ter you know, territory from, uh, or if he's driving his own vehicle. Well, I remember um, listening to this podcast one time, and um, this guy, um, it's actually comedian Bill Burr. Fuck it, I'll go ahead and say his podcast. He doesn't need the plug, but, you know, whatever. I was listening to his podcast, but uh, he he actually was, like, talked to a cop one time, and he's like, hey, man, you know, how, how, how like, what is the best way to get, get away with a murder, like, you know, from, from, like, what you've seen on the field, like, what... Like, how is the, you know, easiest way to get away with it? And some of the stuff that the guy was saying, if I remember correctly, is A, you have no connection to the person you kill whatsoever. So pretty much it has to be random. Like, you have no connection to them in any way, shape, or form. Um, you leave no, any kind of DNA or anything behind, which obviously, apparently, by this guy not sexually assaulting these women, he, he didn't. And I think there was like another thing, but the big thing that stuck out in my mind is, is you really, if you really want to get away with a murder, you have to be as least connected to the person as possible. It almost has to be a random killing to have any chance of getting away with it. Because if you have any connection to that person, then you're going to eventually come up. Um, something that comes to mind for me, another case we haven't covered yet, it was the Brooke Baker uh, murder, the campus murder where she was murdered um, by someone they don't know who it was. I think they did eventually solve it. Actually, yeah, I know for a fact they did. But for a while there, they literally interviewed every single person involved in this girl's life, from the professors to the friends to the fringe people who barely even knew her name. So anybody connected to this girl whatsoever they interviewed and were able to clear, and they even think they took DNA tests from everybody, too. Which is really going above and beyond, you know, which is, you know, something they normally don't do, to my knowledge. They don't do such an extensive collection of DNA from people, but I guess that's how much that case upset that particular community. So, that's how this guy, I think, was able to evade capture for so long, is just the literal random nature of the killings. Because it takes a special kind of psychopath to just go out and do something like that randomly. Like, who would want to take... I love strangers in the sense that, like, I assume that they're all gen generally good. You know, I assume people are generally good until they give me a reason to think otherwise. So a stranger is the last person I would want to kill, you know? If I was to do that to anybody, which I never would and I never could, and I think we were even um, arguing about death penalty on another podcast, and I actually think I was kind of for it and you were against it, so that kind of redacts my last statement. But anyway... Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like that's that's just I don't know. The random nature of it is 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 really the most horrific part. A lot of serial killers. That's that's what they do. It, it's the random. It, like I said, it's it's for the thrill, and, and some for some of them, it's a sexual thrill, and for others, it's 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 just it's a power trip. It's the old, they have power over life and death, and for them, you know, that's something that is just. It, it it it's something that really I I mean, I, I guess they they get excited about it. Yeah, and it becomes an addiction. And uh, once they get that that experience, you know, once they get that experience and and they feel what it's like, I guess, you know, they get like this sort. Of, like I said, it's a thrill. They get this thrill that they don't get from anything else. Uh, and they get it from strangling somebody or shooting somebody or whatever, and then. Just like any addiction, it, it just becomes something that they just cannot stop doing. For a truly um, in-depth analysis into the mind of a killer that I think was pretty good, check out the police song Murder by Numbers. That's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty clever song kind of about maybe a way, uh, the, the way that a, a, kill, a serial killer might think. Anyway, moving on, we have uh, a second, uh, our second fan requested case. And, uh... This isn't really a Mike and Josh pick type dealio, so this is just kind of one that exactly. Mike got slapped um, with and had to do. So. I, I got slapped with it, but you know, I don't mind. I, it's it's one I don't mind talking about because it is one of the earliest cases on the show. I believe it was from season zero, which was like the uh, was when they were showing pilot episodes, technically like specials, and then it turned into a, a weekly show, a weekly series. And this was when, of course, Robert Stack was still hosting, which is interesting when he hosted. It, it, I've always found that interesting that they had these different specials before Robert Stack hosted that were hosted by different people. Yeah, so I've, never, it's, it's, I've never seen any of those. I, I've seen a few clips from them, and it's very surreal because you're just like, Carl Malden, what? I, huh? <laughs> you're just these people, you're just like, this is an unsolved mystery. <laughs> so Dude, you, know, you know what's crazy is um, I have shitty antenna cable. I don't have actual cable. But there's a cool channel called Decades. Um, if just free antenna cable. It's like one of the shows that just comes through the air. And um, they sh have this show in there from time to time. I had never heard of this show. It's called Lords of the Mafia. And you can't even really find it on uh, YouTube or anything, I don't think. Um mm -hmm. Which, hey, if you have it on file, go ahead and put it out because Terry and John don't have anything to do with that one. So, uh, you know, that you shouldn't have to worry about getting slapped down. But Robert Stack is the host of this show and he narrates oh. and he even goes on camera and, and it's like the set is blocked and filmed the same exact way an Unsolved wow. Mysteries segment would be. The only thing that they do different is they have a little bit more of those annoying kind of Farina-esque like graphic uh, things like on the screen and stuff like the compute huh. the fall false computer typing thing on the screen like -do 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 where it says yeah. like the name and date of birth and stuff when they're talking about the crime lords but no it's robert stack he does the voiceovers hmm. he does the narration he's in front of the camera it's literally like you're watching uh a, an unsolved mysteries like cousin show which is almost just as good it's called lords of the mafia it's crazy seeing him on huh. another show, and it, it's... I'd never heard of that show before, yeah. so... Yeah, and it, it's really hard to find anything about it online. You, all you can find is kind of just the basic Wikipedia page about it. But yeah, it still comes on from time to time on this Decades channel that I get for free on uh, my uh, my antenna or whatever. So yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. But anyway. So this case is the case of Aileen uh, uh, Conway. And uh, it all began on the morning of April 29th, 1986. Uh, Farmer was working his fields near Lawton, Oklahoma, and he noticed uh, a peculiar amount of smoke rising from a nearby road. He called the authorities, and 20 minutes later, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol arrived at the scene. They discovered a burning car embedded in a deserted bridge. The heat from which was so intense that the car had actually melted into the metal guardrail. Think about that. Hey, but just seeing that, I mean, that's not your typical just regular burn or whatever. Like, that's something that 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 was it, there had to be something extra added to this car in order to, to burn so 
hot that it melted into the guardrail. Inside the car, the officers noted something very disturbing. Uh, Lieutenant Larry Sally of the Oklahoma Highway Patrol is quoted here. He says, when the Highway Patrol arrived, a body was inside the car, but it was a futile exercise to try to get to the occupant, occupant due to the fact that the car had already burned so badly. The body was burned beyond recognition. Skid marks indicated the car's speed at impact was 50 to 60 miles per hour. To the Highway Patrol, it just seemed like another senseless accident. But apparently, it wasn't. They thought, well, there's th theories that it wasn't, but it, it does seem like it's not just some accident to me when you look at the the uh, evidence and uh, the other aspects of the case. So the authorities believe that this uh, woman who they found in this car, which is a car that belonged to a man named Pat Conway, and uh, the man who owned the car was this woman's husband, uh, Eileen. So the authorities believe that she died in, in just a car accident. Uh, but Pat ended up finding some evidence on his own that she was murdered. On the day of her death, the screen door in the back was left open. Her purse was left behind and the iron was left on. And the garden hose was filling water in the pool. And in the bathroom, the tub was filled with water and the phone was left off the hook. Also, Pat found that the road where Aileen died was unfamiliar. Or Eileen, Aileen, I, I they, think it's they Aileen. Pr they pronounce it Aileen. Because it's an A in front. So uh, neither of them had ever been to this road before her death. And yeah, I, I do I do find that really peculiar, the whole sort of stuff there. I mean, if it was an accident, like why is the screen door left open? The purse is left behind. The iron is left on. The garden hose is still left there filling water in the pool. And uh, the bathroom, the tub was filled with water and the phone was left off the hook. I mean, that sounds like something that's a setup or it sounds like she was in the middle of doing something and then got kidnapped. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the type that's the typical sort of thing you see when it comes to these cases, when people get kidnapped uh, or, you know, abducted from their uh, residence. Uh, a lot of these sort of things are just. It looks like everything's just normal, uh, but, you know, it, the person's just missing. So uh, Pat contacted an investigator himself uh, named Ray Anderson, and uh, they went to the site where the car crashed, and they found a church bulletin that could not have possibly gotten out of the car unless it had actually stopped. So Anderson believed that Aileen was with somebody in their car, and, and the person opened the door set the accelerator, slammed it into drive, hoping to send the car into a creek and making it look like an accident. And because of this, the cause of death was changed from accident to unexplained. Apparently also burn tests showed that the car had also been doused with a substance similar to gasoline. And to this day, no one, nobody really knows why Aileen died. Well, I mean, obviously... Um, it was a murder, you know, but, but the, the, the motive, you know, um, was there anything stolen? You know, I mean, what the, a body was never recovered. No. You know, um, well, the body was, it was, it was the, in the car. It was just, oh, well, they were recognizable. They weren't so. I'm guessing they weren't able to do any kind of like forensics tests um, to see if there was any kind of like sexual abuse or anything. Probably not, because it was burned beyond recognition. Yeah, so it's like kind of one of those things to where it's like they. You have a lot of evidence that points to that this is not an accident, but it's really hard to really, for sure just nail down it was a murder because there just isn't enough evidence. So it's it just unexplained, which has to be really frustrating for Pat, who apparently died on August 20th, 2013, without ever really truly learning the true circumstances of his wife's death. Yeah, that sucks. Definitely does. But I mean, uh, you know, it, uh, it sounds like he went on a good, you know, almost 20 years 
Uh, well, you, no, more than 20 years. Yeah, because the case uh, first aired on November 29th, 1987. So he he probably remarried and, you know, I mean... But God, that's... That's... I don't even want... I mean, like I said, I'm... Yeah, gonna... I mean, knowing knowing that it wasn't an accident, but not still not being able to find a suspect, to be able to, for sure, you know, have her death be labeled as a murder... I mean, it's just unexplained. I mean, that that's got to be. This kind of got to eat away the, at you. This reminds me of the two Mary murders in in a in a bunch of ways. Um, car found burned. The body was burned beyond belief. Yeah. Um, the um, motive motive is unknown. The husband deny. You know, uh, Mike Morris denies. You know, any involvement. So really, the killer is. Unless he did it, which I think he did. Um, or allegedly, I allegedly think he did. <laughs> i got to start saying that. <laughs> or I might get uh, and some more letters from people I don't want to hear from. Um, uh, uh. Although I'm thinking he's probably going to already want to sue me for the uh, slapping his moon pie face comment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those things to where it's, it's kind of a short case. There's really nothing. I mean... I mean it, for a case of this nature, there's really nothing that sticks out too much that kind of like grabs my interest much, except for maybe the church bulletin and how they were saying how she usually drove with the, the windows up all the time with the AC on and how mm. the church bulletin was found outside of the car. So the window, either the window was down or the door was open at some point while maybe while the car was moving. Um, that's really the only thing that kind of fascinated. It also kind of fascinated me as to like why was so much stuff running at the house? Yeah, why was yeah, there a garden that's, hose? That's what really stood out to me because I was like, that seems that that screams of a setup. Yeah, that screams of somebody set that up that way. That does kind of seem like a setup because why why so much stuff uh, uh, incomplete? You had the iron. On you had the uh, garden hose running into the damn pool. I mean, I, I mean the purse being left behind. Okay, that's that's typical. The screen door in the back being left open. All right, but the garden hose, the tub being f still filled with water. The f why was the phone off the hook? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like maybe you could make a case. For, you know, she was trying to start a new life and, like, fake a disappearance. But again, it's like, why would you do it like that? But then again, like, what what was gained from this, if anything? Um, we don't know if there was any kind of sexual assault involved in this. Um, it's, it's, it is it's is pretty mysterious. And they really didn't go in, in depth about the relationship between yeah. Pat and Eileen. So it's kind of like... You know, you never know what goes on behind closed doors with a married couple or with any couple in general. Behind closed doors, you have no idea what they're going through. You don't know what kind of... Everybody has the face that they put out to the public and then the, their real selves. And this is something that's been hard for me to grasp is being the kind of person I am. I am so damn transparent. I'm so easy to talk to and wear my emotions on my sleeve. And, and you know, anybody listening to this podcast knows that... You know, if you reach out to me, I will talk to you. You know, I mean, I I just don't care. I have no, I have nothing to hide. You know, I I, but I'm not like most people. Most people have stuff they want to hide. Most people want to keep up a wall and keep you know only certain things released to the public and many things they want to keep to themselves. And you you know, these people could have had a very tumultuous marriage uh, may i don't know you know i mean obviously they weren't implicating pat in anything because if they felt like he was responsible for anything they might be like oh well you know the husband may yeah. have had her killed by somebody See, that, else that's what, that's what i'm thinking i mean usually the show if there is like a suspect okay if the husband's a suspect then they do discuss that it seems like I mean, would an investigator really work with the guy if they if he thought if they thought he was a suspect? I mean, I don't think I don't think he was involved in this. I I, I that's my personal opinion because I don't really see anything from this this segment that really shows me that that could be the case. Um, but then I also thought that one guy who was a police officer and and 
said, you know, he said he didn't kill his little girl or whatever. I, I thought, I, you know, I thought I believed him, but apparently <laughs> I was wrong. Well, also, uh, so, also you got to look at the uh, kind of the the sheriff departments in, in these towns, too, because there's also these good old boy networks where the cops yeah. uh, will go out of their way to cover up for people that they like in the community. And they'll mm. bend over backwards and there are crooked cops and there are there are commissioners and sheriffs and all these other people who will, um, you know. Yeah. They'll they'll cover things up for somebody if they're a member of the community that is you know you don't hear about it because it's 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 fucking illegal and and rotten that's why you don't hear about it a lot but it, it I, I would be naive to say that oh that never happens. Well, apparently authorities believe that Aileen's death might be connected to several burglaries in the area, and that when she walked in on the burglars, they abducted and killed her. But I'm like, why would they do it that elaborately? Like, why would burglars be like, oh, we're going to make it look like a, an accident? Like, I don't know. Most burglars I think of, I mean, maybe this is me. I mean, most of the burglary cases I, I see featured on the show, I read about, they don't try to be that elaborate on how they kill the person, the witness. They just, like, shoot them or strangle them or whatever in the house and leave them for dead and then leave. I mean, that's... Yeah, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So this is truly a pretty unsolved, uh, like a uh, you know fairly unsolved um, murder here. I mean, this is this is definitely up there with some of the more mysterious ones. But nothing more mysterious than our next and final um, segment that we're going to cover, which was this one actually was requested. I do remember who requested this one: Thomas Hatfield, the legendary Thomas Hatfield, who designed our uh, logos for our new uh, podcast or whatever. Uh, he Thank you, Thomas. Yes, thanks again. Um, he requested, this was one of the few he requested, and this was one that I already wanted to talk about, and this is one that I already told um, our one of our very dedicated listeners, Corinne. This is one I told her that I would talk about because it had to do with her home uh, continent of Australia, and this is the Australian UFO. Um Damn it if I don't get chills up and down my leg whenever I start talking about UFO cases because uh, they're, they're kind of my personal favorites uh, amongst the fraud segments. Um, so, October 21st, 1978, 6.19 p.m., continent of Australia. A single-engine Cessna 182 lifted off from Robin Airport just south of Melbourne. The pilot was 20-year-old F- Frederick Valentek. Uh, Valentik had been flying for two years and he had accumulated more than 150 hours of solo time. He had dreams of one day becoming a commercial airline pilot. Valentik's flight plan plan called for a 40-minute trip west along the Australian coast. At Cape Otway, I'm sorry if I'm butchering any of this, Cape Otway, he'd head south to the Bass Strait to King Island. It was a route he had followed on several occasions. But this flight would be anything but routine. Ken, however the hell you say this last name, he's got two L's, E W E L Y N, Lewin, Lewin, Lulin, Lulin. Ken, well, if it was Spanish, it'd be Ye- Yewelin. I don't know. Ken of his name's Ken. Damn it, Ken of the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, was saying that it was a fairly normal exercise. He had an appropriate instrument rating for the trip, it was a fairly straightforward flight, and there was no reason why it shouldn't have been completed successfully. What happened three-fourths of the way into that flight will be one of the greatest mysteries of Australian aviation. If that doesn't whet your appetite, I don't know what will. Just over halfway through his flight, Valentik had been in contact with a flight service center on the ground. Evidence mounted that something was not quite right. The following transcript was based off the interaction that Valentik had with the Flight Service Center. Now, Valentik's in the sky in his plane now, and it's showing him communicating with the, the Flight Service Center on the ground. Quote, Seems like some sort of li- landing lights. As it gets closer, it could be one or two lights. I don't know. This is Delta Sierra Juliet. That aircraft just passed over me at least a, th- a thousand feet above. Roger, and is that large aircraft? Is it a large aircraft? Confirm. Back to Valentik. Is there any Air Force aircraft in this vicinity? 
Delta Sierra Juliet, no known aircrafts in the vicinity. Delta Sierra Juliet, seems like he's playing some sort of cat and mouse game over here. He's traveling over me at speeds I cannot, I cannot identify. Then ground control. Can you describe the aircraft? Valentic. As it passes by, it's a long shape. Back to ground control. And they're interviewing him this time. He wasn't to the point of where he was panicking, but he was genuinely concerned with what he saw. He sounded confused, then he described what the aircraft was doing, and I became a bit concerned too. Back to the exchange. This thing's just stationary. I'm just orbiting, and this thing's orbiting on top of me. It's got a green light, and it's sort of metallic. It's like shining all over. It just disappeared. You wouldn't know what sort of aircraft is up here, do you? Is this some sort of air, air, military aircraft, or what? Delta Sierra Juliet, now approaching from southwest. Then they say some pilot jargon that I don't understand, even from the reenactment. This strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's... It's not an aircraft. And then bizarre, unidentified clicks followed right after the radio transmission. Click, 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 click. Delta Sierra Juliet, this is Melbourne. Come in. Do you copy? Nothing. Flying a single-engine airplane over water in such a strange situation, I was concerned. So we put out a distress phase, and then we started the search. This is what the ground control said after the fact. They then interview his father, who has a very thick, like, Jewish-Greek accent combined with an Australian accent. Very trippy-sounding. He felt bad for the guy, because he was talking about his son and how he missed him and no idea what happened to him. For days, a flotilla of search vessels crisscrossed Bass Strait. There was absolutely no sign of Valentik or his aircraft. No sign that there had even been a crash. All that remained was a final baffling radio transmission. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. These were Fred Valentik's last words, which made people believe that Frederick came in contact with a UFO. However, it was nothing more than speculation until a witness came forward with a startling first-hand account. Now, before we get into that startling first-hand account, let's just think about this for a second. His final words that they have a transcript of from the air traffic control was, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. That sends chills down my spine. Yeah, it's a very chilling uh, thing to think about and definitely listen to. Um I, I just wish the reenactment, I don't know, spent a little bit more money on some of the special effects. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, to me, they the, the story was so damn creepy that it was such a good story to work with that it was uh, it was okay that they skimped. And I know yeah. what, I know what you mean, but this guy, for the whole exchange when he's up in the air, he's basically calling this thing an aircraft. In his mind, he, he believes it to be an aircraft, and he's saying it's zigzagging, it's doing this, it's doing that, it's, hover, it's orbiting right above me. And then at the very end, he finally gets some clarity as this thing reveals itself to him, and he says, it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. He finally figured out what it was. He knows what we all wish we knew. He saw it. He was there right in front of it. In the well, I air. I wouldn't want to be there in I, his position. I wouldn't want to be because... there, but I want to know what he saw. Because in all UFO literature and in, in the kind of the accounts that we have, people encounter UFOs in one of two situations. The UFO is landed and they encounter it like that, or the UFO is up in the air and the person is on the ground witnessing this. This is one of the first times, excluding the Belgian UFO case, where a pilot is actually making contact with an unidentified flying object while he is also in the air with the object. And as he said, it's playing an eerie cat and mouse game with him. And it's not an aircraft. <laughs> that was just so... Good lord. I mean, that is one of the creepiest lines of the UFO cases on Unsolved Mysteries is it's hovering and it's not an aircraft. Click, 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 click. No one knows what the clicking sound was. Nobody can explain it. Around the time of Valentik's disappearance, the eyewitnesses um, and an and eyewitness and his family were coming back from an outing when they noticed something unusual in the sky. The witnesses saw a long, a long green light, 
and they set and they parked their car and got outside and they watched this light for a few seconds. The green light got closer to this airplane. And then it shows the guy who's being interviewed who wanted to remain in silhouette. And he said, I said, that plane's coming down pretty steep. It's as if it's coming down at a 45 degree angle. That plane's going to crash. And right above the plane going diagonally down right on top of it was this green light. However, the witnesses did not actually witness the plane crash into Bass Strait because it went behind a mountain. Three weeks later, an amateur photographer came forward with what most people believe is evidence of what really happened at Bass Strait. This guy was taking photos of a sunset. His name's Roy Manifold. When he got his photos developed, he saw all the pictures of the sunset and everything looked normal except for the last print. There was a blemish on the print and Roy thought it was a mistake by the photo lab. But then he thought, well, wait a second, this is around the same time that that guy crashed in that plane and nobody knows what happened to him. So he thought maybe this blemish on this photo, maybe this was something more. Maybe this wasn't a developing error. Maybe this is revealing something in the picture that is of significance. So then at that point, he sent his negatives to a leading Australian photo lab. They analyzed the negatives and they found neither Dort, 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 God, my freaking voice, Dirt nor debris on the negative. The film was later sent to the United States for com computer analysis by a team of UFO researchers. They claimed the blot was actually a solid metallic object enveloped in a cloud of exhaust. However, a second, more recent analysis concluded that the spot is in all probability a development error. Now, I want to stop right there, okay? Now, <laughs> the Roy Manifold, the guy who took this picture... He sees a blemish, but then he thinks, well, wait a second, this is the same time that this Valentic guy disappeared. So now he's thinking, maybe I have an unidentified flying object in this picture on camera. But then he sends it to a UFO research team in the United States. Now, what do you think a UFO research team is going to conclude that this picture is going to be? Do you think they're going to conclude that it's... You know, nothing and a hoax. No, they're absolutely going to try to conclude that it is a UFO or evidence of a UFO because, you know, there's some there's... upstart UFO investigation, you know, uh, company or not really. I don't know if company is the right word for it group. And they, you know, they'd like to get publicity or, or just just want to prove that they're actually on the right track, that they're not crazy, that, oh, here's evidence. You've been asking us for evidence, well, here it is. Now, this is one of those cases um, where it's like you, you have this thing that, that really happened that was weird and kind of unexplained. Again, I, I recall the Diane Lebanek situation, although this situation with the Australian UFO is a bit more innocent. You have it's kind of like the Guardian. You yeah, know, like, you, you yeah. have a very legitimate thing that did happen that's unexplainable, but then you have this thing after the fact that that attempts to almost mire the uh, credibility of the entire thing by saying, "Oh, look, I have a picture of this thing," and this leading UFO research group says that it's a solid metallic object enveloped in a cloud of exhaust. But you know, I worked in a photo lab for about five years and I I've taken classes in photography and all and I can tell you that when you're developing uh, pictures the old school way the old-fashioned way um, there are so many things that can go wrong okay first of all there was nothing on the negative but yet there's something in the picture all right well there are two different machines in an old-school photo lab that that were used. There's a scanner which scans the negative into the computer where you can actually adjust kind of the hue and the brightness and contrast and, and all that. You can adjust the pictures and then you have the printer that actually prints out your 4x6s, your uh, 5x7s, your 8x10s, etc. Your glossies, your matte finishes and all that. If, and I can tell you from working at a CVS store that did not give two shits about their photo lab, if that printer is not calibrated correctly, and it is not cleaned regularly, and it is not taken care of the way it should be, 
there were so many instances where I would print out pictures and there'd be this little black, almost like, looked like it was in the picture, kind of schmutz on the, on the picture. And it was gunk from the printer. Yeah, it wasn't on the negative. It wasn't uh, in the original picture. But when it printed out, it almost, it, you know, because these, these printers, they use so many chemicals. Uh, they use so much heat. Uh, there's a lot of processes going on that made an old school 4x6 print that you might have in a photo album. There was a lot that, that went into making those prints. It's not like a, a picture you print off of the printer at your house that uses ink and paper and that's it. No, no. We're talking about, you know, uh, developers, stabilizers, bleach fixers, all kinds of weird chemicals that you'd never find in an oil printer. These things can go awry in so many different ways. And when the picture comes out, you can, if it comes out in, an, in a, say, like a sunset picture where you do have a lot of contrast between blacks and light, lighter colors, and there is a black smear on there, you could see something like that and be like, oh, well, that must, the sun's going down, so that's a silhouette of something. But in all actuality, it's just a black smudge. This is where people uh, get a little carried away sometimes when it comes to UFO fever. I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid so much to say I believe across the board, 9 times out of 10 or 100 times out of 100, uh, they're always right. It's always a legitimate thing. I looked at this instantly and I thought this, this is a developing era. Anytime you're dealing with film, there are so many things that can go wrong in development. So this... Uh, was of no surprise to me when a second more recent analysis concluded that the spot is in all probability a developing era. It's called not calibrating your printer correctly. You get all kinds of crap on your on your pictures. I've had to go through it so many times with the printer back at the place I used to work at, which whose name I've already named, so I don't know why I'm acting like I'm going to protect their identity. <laughs> However, skeptics um, tend to dismiss the photo as just a, another far-fetched effort to prove the existence of visitors from outer space. Now, even though I agree with the skeptics on this one, I just feel like the the, the fact that they used the phrase far-fetched effort was kind of dickish, so they still get this treatment right here. <laughs> so, even for people prone not to believe in UFOs, the events on that day continue to defy explanation. Defy explanation, I'm sorry. There was no recovery of the wreckage, still none. He's gone. We're left with an open case. Sounds like he did encounter something very mysterious. And there's no other conclusion that uh, that can be made from that. He's been declared legally dead, uh, Frederick, and no trace of him or his plane has ever been found. That's so crazy. Did they ever find the uh, missing um, flight um, in like what 2014 or? Oh, Bermuda Bermuda Triangle thing. Like no, uh, the uh, uh, flight the, 19. The no, the M M1 whatever the one flying to Bangladesh or the one you know, like, know. a few years ago. I don't know. It was I, like, dude, it was like a fucking like commercial airliner that went missing, hmm. and like from my knowledge, I. They might have found a little bit of wreckage from it, but I think for the most part, all the people in the plane itself are still missing. Like, So, yeah, one theory is that Frederick was abducted by the object he encountered. Another theory is that he was attacked by the object or became disorientated after seeing it and crashed into the sea. I think the crashing into the sea thing is the most uh, plausible because there's that witness who said he saw the plane... Yeah, diving, doing a dive bomb, and then the la last time we saw it is when it pretty much disappeared behind a mountain. So, yeah, just because nobody knows what happened to him doesn't mean that necessarily that it's something mysterious. Um, then they cut to his dad, and you know you feel so bad for the dad because you knew the dad was like, and you know the dad's some kind of an immigrant from some kind of like uh, European country. He's like, it is hard. I'm very sentimental. I kept everything of his, even the motor car he drove to the airport. I still drive. I think one day my son will come back, and this is a dream that I have that one day might come true. It's like, man, I'm so poor guy. He just want to give him a I, freaking hug. I think he's watched uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind too many times. He thinks his 
Sun's going to come back. And even if he does, I mean, think about that. I mean, like the Coast Encounters of the Third Kind thing, where all these people were abducted by these aliens or then returned back to Earth so many years later. I mean, can you imagine that? You're hey, some Mike. World War II pilot who gets sent to gets brought. Oh, you haven't seen that movie? I've never seen that movie. <laughs> I'm surprised. Wow, that one's really shocking because that's got UFO uh, experts and and uh, right, you know, uh, writers in it. I think Stanton Friedman has a ca- as a cameo in it. A few other people. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I suck, man. I I. I... One day, it seems like, I don't know, I, it, hopefully if I don't die... I think you would really it. like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I'm I sure I would. To, I'm sure I'd you like... Need to, you need to find that, whether it's online, wherever, because you're into UFOs, trust me, it, it's worth a watch. Steven Spielberg directed it. Um, it's, well, honestly, I think it's one of his best uh, jobs direct, one of his best directorial efforts. Uh Richard Dreyfus is the lead. Oh, I like Richard uh, Dreyfus. And uh, you got a great score by John Williams. Oh, John Williams. And that's where the you hear the that's where the dun 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 thing comes from, which is a very memorable uh, note. Yeah, a uh, series of notes. So you probably heard that at least. <laughs> yeah, that part I do remember from from I think I love the '80s on VH1. I love back- the '70s. Yeah. Okay, yeah, back back when that show was on VH1, that that I remember that being one of the last shows that VH1 put out that I like gave. A I shit love, about. I love, I love those series. I love that series. I, I liked really them. I love the seventies, eighties, nineties. I liked them, but they they started doing weird shit. Like I love the eighties remix, and I love the eighties three D. And I liked that though. I thought they were still fun. I love the eighties part two, and no, not not. I love the eighties strikes back. And I love the eighties. Three uh, um, D was it? Three D? Yeah, it was three D. I don't know. Like some of the things, some of the things they 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 would talk about. Like it would get on my nerves because because I knew they were just like hired comics and they had to say funny stuff about whatever it was they were talking about. Well, yeah, about. some some of some of the hired comics were annoying. Like the guy was just being awkward. Michael Michael guy. Ian Black. Uh, no, Mikey and Black, I can deal with over the guy who was like a redhead and he had like a beard. And like he would always like make things really weird mm-hmm. and sexual. Yeah, that guy, I, I could do without him. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, hit, hit and miss, but they're still really entertaining, I thought. I remember now, they, but, they, ta- they spoke very poorly of Unsolved Mysteries, which I, I remember. Yeah, back then. That, it, that, that was weird. I didn't get that. That angered me. And they, they harped on they harped on the uh, reenactments. It's like, dude, okay, you know, I, f- I feel like that show, amongst other things, kind of started breeding that too cool for school attitude that a lot yeah. of kids have now. To where, like, if any, you know, you, you can't have, everything's got to be cool, everything's got to be hip, you can't have anything, you know, that's just honest to goodness anymore. It's all got to have some kind of sarcastic, like, smart alecky kind of, like, Oh, sticker. the ironic thing, you yeah. know, it's like, it's like liking some terrible wrestler, because, ironically... Like Macho then... Man, like how people like, you know, oh, they like him, but really, they just, they, they think he's a joke, and, you know, kind of... No, I mean... Macho Man, Randy Savage in his prime was actually a really good wrestler. He's so. a really great entertainer in general. For um, sure. But I'm talking about people like James Ellsworth lately, who's just a jobber, who's just been put into you know, this bigger role. And because he's the fans, he's so over with the fans because they ironically like him. And I, oh, I don't really? get the I don't get the ironically liking wrestlers. Oh, he's the greatest ever, but not really. I don't like I, I don't like don't. ironically liking anything. Like at my <laughs> at my gigs, I play Phil Collins from time to time because I think he has some good fucking songs. So do I. And people are sitting there and they're bobbing their head, but they're also grinning and laughing. And I'm like, dude, what what's the deal? Like Phil Collins is a badass. Like and and you can't oh. even say that now without getting laughed off. The face of the earth by most people because they think that he's corny and he's sappy. If you listen to anything he did in Genesis in the eighties and seventies, yeah. it, it, with, with his, I mean, 
He's one of yes. the greatest drummers of all time, first of all. One of the greatest drummers. I mean, his drum sound is iconic. His voice is iconic. I mean, the experiment, I mean, he's... Yeah, he had the side to him where he wanted to write sappy love songs, but he also had a side to him where he was highly, you know, into jam sessions and like like he had a band called Brand X, which was nothing but like a jam band kind of thing. And then he had Genesis, which was like the perfect blend of pop and progressive rock. And dude, he is one of the baddest dudes out there. And yet he has this rep of just being terminally un uncool and unhip. And, and I just hate that... Uh, that I, that whole ironic liking someone, you know, you know, tongue in cheek, grinning about it, you know. Oh, I love Phil Collins. It's like, dude, I, I, I just, I don't know. That's that. a new, that's a new thing. I think I it's very really... new, yeah. And that's something that did not exist in the '80s and '90s. And that was what was so refreshing about the '80s and '90s. Is I mean, there, I guess in the '90s it kind of started that whole ironic thing, you know, like Nirvana and the grunge, you know, the. Uh -huh. All the disenfranchised teens, you know, like, oh, yeah, you like, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. <laughs> yeah, real cool. But then it just, it, like, evolved from that snarkiness to just complete, like, you know, tongue-in-cheek, grinning. The internet, I think, uh, bred that, yeah, to be honest. Yeah, I think for, it started at 4chan, and then it just kind of spilled over it, into... It's, 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 uh, it's a carryover from meme culture to yeah. me, personally. And now you like, I mean, good lord! All you got to do is like just go out and look at the T-shirts now. I mean, the just meme <laughs> central with the goddamn T-shirts, and they're even in Walmart now. Like, you know, they'll you'll you'll have the shirts where it's like a, a picture of like the galaxy, and there'll be like slices of pizza and like kitty cats shooting lasers out uh -huh, of their eyes. Yeah, and that you know, they oh, that's so epic. You know, the kids think uh -huh. that's just that's epic. You know. Like, and it's like, you know, oh, yeah, isn't this the coolest shirt ever? But, you know, I don't really think it's cool. It's so lame, but that's why it's cool. It's like, dude, oh, I can't stand that. that I can't stand that either. So and I don't, I, yeah, I don't like it when people, you know, judge movies like that as well. Um, but, yeah, going back to what I was talking about with Close Encounters, there's a plot there. It opens up with uh, they find the missing Flight 19 in the desert somewhere, which I think is a really cool way to open up the movie. And then there's the climax is, you know, these people end up getting released from the UFO and they're all these old, you know, World War Two pilots and they're let they've been missing for 30 something years or longer than that. And now they're back on Earth. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's like, can you imagine being that one of those pilots just back on Earth now, 30, 40 years later? So that's what I was talking about with Frederick's dad. I mean, he's waiting for him to come back, and, you know, that could be a good and bad thing. I mean, you, could, you know, maybe he was just flying on some spaceship for 40 years, and then they release him. But, you know, he's released a world he doesn't know. And most of the people that he doesn't, you know, that he does know probably, you know, either don't remember him unless it's his family. And it's just there's all this kind of dynamic that is very – it's kind of – did you, Scary. did you just spoil the ending to that movie for me? Oh, come on. <laughs> you, you know all about you that. You fucker. <laughs> now I'm not going to watch it. Because oh, now I on. already know how it ends. No, I'll probably still watch it. Because that's not really about what the... And, and it's a, it's like a 30-year-old movie, so I'm not spoiling anything. You're, th um, you're 30 years old. No, I'm not. I'm almost 30 years old. Yeah, me too. Not it's, there. it's depressing. Let's not talk about it. So this segment ends. I just want to cap this off because it's got a great ending. Uh, Robert Stack goes, 15 years have passed since Frederick Valentic flew off into his uncertain fate. However, the circumstances under his mysterious disappearance are just as disturbing today. What was the green light seen over the Cessna? And did it overpower Frederick Valentic's plane? Maybe the secret lies many fathoms beneath Bass Strait. Or perhaps... It lies far from our planet, light years beyond our understanding. <laughs> Man, those writers' pens must have been on fire after they got done. Some of these lines, some of these ending lines they have for Robert Stack, and then how he delivers them. I mean, it's just like, mwah, mwah, like I'm a French chef of like good uh, Unsolved Mysteries episodes, and I'm going to put a little little creepy writing in there, and mwah, I'm going to throw a dash of Robert Stack's beautiful voiceover, and, and uh, I don't know, just for, 
for craziness, I'm gonna throw in some creepy music in there. Mwah, just beautiful, like a French pasta. Just that's that's what that is to me. You know, it's just that's just delectable. It, it all comes together for a souffle of greatness. You know, and and that's and that's what this segment was. Um, it's not great that he's gone, um, but yeah, I mean, the, good lord, I mean. Could, I wish you guys could see this segment because it's it's a beautiful segment. It is on the ultimate collection under the UFO category. That you know they would have been cool. UFO seems to be one of the the sets from the box set that's affordable. I've noticed. I think you can get that on Amazon for like twenty bucks. Really? Now the other ones, not so much. That's and I'm that, kicking myself for not buying some of them when I saw them for cheap. When I had money for cheaper. When I was in, uh, I think it was I saw some of them in Oklahoma, and I, I'm kicking myself that I didn't buy them then because I was like, oh, well, you know, they'll still be there. No. <laughs> well, that's what I thought but, too. Well, that just shows you how how much of a fan base the show has. I mean, right there, and and they they purposely limited the supply, so you know. Well, first look probably didn't make that many anyway, um, because first look is a pretty low budget. Uh, distribution company that's unsolved mystery is probably the best thing that they've ever released to be honest <laughs> first look entertainment uh but i do have my own sort of it's it's a leg kind of thing but you know i i still have the box set it's just not the physical i i love to get that one day but yeah well unless one of our fans graciously donates it to you <laughs> <laughs> Six hundred dollars worth. I've seen some. I've seen some crazy prices for that on eBay, like a thousand dollars. Yeah, some best of, offer. Some of them I see are sealed, which makes me feel like fucking scalpers got in there at the get go yeah. and just bought up a bunch of them, which pisses me the fuck off. I hate scalpers. God, That's a whole I hate. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, my my I I love the show since the early days. This is the Unsolved Mysteries: The Ultimate Collection box set. That's one of the only things that I can say that I bought when it was out and affordable that became rare later on. Like, mm -hmm. nothing have I, I have never bought anything on purpose. Not any CDs or, or, uh, I would think some of those might be out of print. Some of the collectors. CDs, CDs out. aren't really worth jack shit yet. Um, maybe down the road they will be. Um, but well, eight tracks still aren't worth anything, and neither are audio cassettes. Well, so. it's kind of one of those fatty th fad things, you know. Well, some cassettes actually are worth a good bit of money, depending. Like, really? Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> cassettes have a niche. Uh, kind of uh community much like vhs tapes there there there's huh. there's a cassette community i, I did not know there there was a cassette community. yeah um it's kind of got that same um it well it has a different appeal at, than vinyl because you know uh -huh. with, with vinyl you get all the purists who say it just sounds better and that's i, I never got that and um, to be honest i i've i've listened to vinyl compared to cd and i, I mean it's better with cassette because cassette is not really the whole thing about vinyl versus CD to end all arguments. If you have a shitty pair of speakers and you're playing your favorite, I don't know, what some, uh, the XX album or something like that, or any, any of your favorite records, and you're using some shitty little speakers, you're not going to hear a difference. Yeah. <laughs> it's no. about the hi-fi equipment more than it is anything else. It's about it's about the bit rate that the song was processed uh -huh. at. It's about, you know, is it in waveform? You know, is it in FLAC form? You know, th these are all things that kind of matter, the, you know, but really at the end of the day, it, it's it's your it's your stereo system. If you have a high end hi fi set setup that's set to play, you know CDs or whatever at their highest quality, and you have the subwoofer and you have everything calibrated the right way, your shit's gonna sound good regardless of what it is. Yeah, it's gonna sound great. So mm -hmm. to like sit there and say that by buying the the big black wafer over buying the tiny little shiny thing, you're getting such be better audio quality. You're full of shit. <laughs> you're just full of shit. And let it it. I mean, 
if you have an FL, a, what's called a flak file, which is an un, the uncompressed. Yeah, I can. I've seen those. I, I I can play them with my VLC media player, but I can't really play them. Yeah, like, if you have a flak music you know. file, I mean that that is honestly the highest quality audio you're going to get. Um, that that is the engineer in the studio when he's playing back the song from his board. That's ex- exactly what that is. Um, but I mean, you know, I don't know. I could, I could go on about that, but it, 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 it look, if you want to make Sounds the, like another video, <laughs> I, 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 nobody wants to hear about it. Nobody wants to hear an old man and a cranky old man cry about CDs versus vinyl. But I guess my final thought is if you're into record collecting because you like how big the artwork is and you kind of like the kind of the, the touch and feel that is a thousand percent more valid of an argument than than the people who actually try to tell me that it sounds better, because that I get. You go in yeah. there and you see you see these beautiful like works of art, you know, and they're they're blown up to like this big big size, you know, like twelve by twelve or whatever. It's like uh, it's like VHS and uh, laser discs. Right, laser discs are laser discs are closer to records than VHS because laser discs are actually pretty much the size of a record really and the they you know that there are some laser discs that have some really great artwork other ones are just like the typical artwork you saw on the vhs or whatever so it's not really that much of a difference but it's just kind of cool to have a, a, a movie that's the size of a record so yeah. it's kind of like you're collecting records but it's movies i mean especially, um, especially for the older bands you know because they've done a lot of reissues now because vinyl has kind of become uh, it's very fatty right now and it's very the vhs in. in particular has some really great artwork that other releases don't have and that's something that really separates vhs from a lot of dvds and blu-rays nowadays unless it's from certain companies like scream factory or whatever a lot of these companies just really generic, bland, awful-looking cover art that just is just the laziest Photoshop shit imaginable. <laughs> well, yeah, that's like that's like now with like new bands, like they'll they'll come out with like a record of their new album, and it's funny because it's like you know, record is like analog. You know, yeah, you have a physical needle that's going against a groove and it's it's creating sound. Yet the record was entirely made on a computer using Pro Tools and copying and cut and paste things and it's all auto-tuned and all that. So it's funny that they're releasing something that's so digital and it was recorded and made so digitally, they're reco- they're releasing it on an analog medium like that's going to make a fucking difference, you know? Exactly. You might as well listen to a digital work on a digital form because that's yeah. honestly what it's mixed and mastered for. Well, also digital digital music uh, depends on who's doing the remastering and stuff. That can sound really well as really good as well. I mean, some I think MP3 kind of gets a bad rap. But I mean it's like you need to get a high quality one. Like if you get a shitty quality MP3, no wonder it doesn't sound good. It, um, I mean it I don't know. I I I I don't particularly like it's like I wish all my music were wave files, but that that would Wave Wave is different. MP3 uh, it, you know, there's also there's certain high quality MP3s that I've noticed I yeah, when albums. you when you get into the 320 kilobyte range of MP3s, yes. it's like okay, that's that's cool, you know. But when but I think most CDs are typically at about like one. And also, when you have it, also it's what you're listening with. Like if you're using headphones and you got some crappy headphones, well, then it's not really going to sound very good. You're not going to really tell that much of a difference because you're using crappy headphones. Yeah. So, right. uh, but yeah. Uh, Sorry about the chit chat. Well, <laughs> Whatever, man. I thought, it was, is... I thought it was interesting, though. I thought it was kind of fun to talk about that because it is, it is kind of, you know, it's a fun. It's fun to talk about something lighthearted at the end of talking about two murders and a mysterious uh, UFO. Yeah, a guy who's just completely disappeared off the face of the earth. Never so, seen uh, if you guys want to find us all over the internet, you can find us on. You can become a fan on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash uncovering unexplained mysteries. If you want to uh, support this podcast on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash uncovering unexplained mysteries. On Patreon, you'll find a lot of bonus perks. Uh, you'll you get the podcast early um, for certain tiers. You can um, send us your requests through there. We got uh, the requests that we're talking about today uh, came directly from Patreon. So 
there you go. Um, you know that those wouldn't have uh, the the ones that were just on the Facebook and anywhere else. Those are gonna get kicked to the back of the line because if people are paying for that service, then we're gonna do their request first. Um, you know, you'll get uh, customized shout outs, and if you do the twenty dollar tier, you get actually get an extra segment, a couple extra segments per month um, that that we will not be posting. Uh, it's worth doing the twenty dollar tier just to listen to Mike's rant about the uh, Bobby Baskin case. Um, which used to be on SoundCloud, but I took it off cause for, for various reasons with uh, Mike and kind of Bobby got into it or whatever. So we, see, we didn't want it to be as public, but uh, that, that one's uh, Mike solo on that one. But uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he got pretty passionate about it. Um, on YouTube, if you want to find us uh, individually on YouTube, which some of you have, which is amazing. Um, Mike does a lot of movie reviews, and it's uh, really entertaining. I like just sitting back and putting on one of Mike's videos, and I'll play like my Game Boy or something while I listen to him rant and rave about something. It's uh, youtube.com slash OCP communications. Now, my YouTube channel, I do a bunch of, you know, just random shit. Like, I'll try British food. I'll review video games. Um just all kinds of stuff, uh, TV shows, uh, my Halloween episode, I reviewed a bunch of those ghost shows that were on TV, like A Haunting and uh, My Ghost Story and uh, Paranormal Witness. Uh, my channel is youtube.com slash dancing with ghosts. Um, that's it for this week. Next week will be even more requests from you guys. Try to knock all these out, hopefully in December, which I doubt we will, but we'll get a large chunk taken out anyway. Um, for me and Mike, that's that's all that's all we got for you this week, and uh, there you have it. Uh, yeah, see you later. <laughs>